Okay, so welcome to module six. And for this module, I'm going to talk about considerations and tools for complex data sets. And it's also built around a group discussion as well. So please feel free to, as you have been, uh, ask questions, clarifications, anything like that. And uh, we'll, we'll go on, go ahead. So by the end of this lecture, you'll be able to understand the principles behind multi-species identification. This is something we do quite a bit in my lab, whether we're looking at host and pathogen or even between uh, pathogens themselves. Uh, fungal bacterial pathogens are ones that we typically look at. Uh, and also in the, we also look at plants and uh, bacterial infections too. You'll be familiar with some of the different tools for interaction mapping. Be introduced to data integration strategies, uh, particularly proteomics and metabolomics. I'll show an example of that. And then that will be followed up within module seven in more detail. And then be familiar with some of the proteomics validation techniques. So I've had a couple people ask if they have to use Western blot to validate their proteomics. And I, me, I say no. A reviewer is going to say yes. So we'll talk about uh, strategies to do that and to get around it. Okay, so I, I've set up each of these uh, portions to have considerations and applications. And the considerations are kind of questions that we ask ourselves when we start an experiment as to, you know, what is the goal or what is the purpose behind doing this? So for multi-species proteome profiling, one of the important things that we consider is whether we need to do an enrichment. And so at the beginning of the workshop, I talked about how you know, we may look at fungi and macrophage or fungal infections in a host, and then we do, we no longer, we don't uh, separate those out technically in the lab, but we do it bioinformatically. And now you've downloaded FASTA files, you've gone through MaxQuant, for example, and you can upload different FASTA files. So with the, um, if you had a macrophage infected with Cryptococcus, you could upload the mouse FASTA file as well as the Cryptococcus FASTA file, and MaxQuant would process them and it will like, put it a protein identifier and identify proteins within each of those FASTA files, so each of those species. There will be a little bit of overlap, depending on the homology, of course. If you were looking at mouse and rat, your homology would be quite a bit. So you'd have a lot of overlap in those systems. If you're looking at bacteria and fungi, there really isn't much overlap. So if you ran the cryptococcal samples against the bacterial FASTA file, or a FASTA proteum of bacteria, you'd identify about six or eight proteins. So there really isn't that much that you will be um, losing. But one of the nice things in the software is that it will tell you, does this belong to the host or does this belong to the pathogen? And so you can bring in information in the species and which FASTA file it's generating it from. And that gives us a lot of bioinformatics power because that way you can then look at host pathogen interactions really within any biological system. There are some technical limitations, and so you have to consider, uh, for example, when we're setting up an infection state, you have to consider both the host side and the pathogen side. So you don't want to kill the host entirely. We want to be able to collect a proteome on them. I'm thinking macrophage, not, not human hosts. I will clarify. You don't want to destroy all of your macrophage cells. Uh, at the same time, you want to have a high enough level of burden so that you can detect your pathogen cells. So this often uh, requires some optimization, some testing. Uh, you need to find that range at which the host can respond and your pathogen can survive uh, versus not having enough of the pathogen to be able to detect it. Some of that can also be then uh, instrumentation. So whether you're doing a DDA or a DIA approach may also drive some of that. As I mentioned, the distinction we can do bioinformatically, which gives us a lot of power downstream that we don't have to plan everything upstream. You can put in the double FASTA files. In our lab, we've turned this as dual perspective profiling. So where we're looking at two biological systems at once, and that's quite a uh, unanimous term that we can use, whether it's plant or host or mouse or uh, fungi, bacteria. And it allows you to do different protein ID mapping to each of those uh, biological systems. And so you can study them then uniquely as they are. You can study just the pathogen response, or you could study just the host response. It gives you the power to do that or everything all together. And as I mentioned with the proteome overlap, it really depends on how close the species are that you're working with. 
For applications, uh, biomarker signatures is one, is one of the areas that we work on for this, uh, where we look at how the host responds to infection versus how the pathogen adapts to infection. And it really gives you more power for that identification. So if you're thinking about you know, moving protein level signatures into a clinical application, if you, if you were able to target proteins from both perspectives, it would give you information on the status of the infection, what is causing the infection, perhaps the state of infection, uh, the effectiveness of any drugs that are being used for therapy. So it gives you a bit more flexibility in that sense as well. We can look at how the host responds to infection, how the pathogen responds to infection, or if you're looking at two different cell lines, you can kind of consider those different parameters use it for new target identification. And so if you have, uh, we, of course we work with a lot of host pathogen context uh, in experiments, that's that's where my examples come from, but you can uh, elaborate them or think about them in other contexts. But if you want to identify perhaps a new target to, yeah. that you could um, inhibit to weaken a pathogen to help clear the immune system, or you want to produce something new, then doing the bio, the two perspective allows you to do that. Also for more uh, foundational biological insights can be a good value as well. And then on here, I have the microbiome. Uh, is there anyone in the group doing microbiome research? Where you're saying, yeah, you would, you would probably face that. So with microbiome, that adds an extra layer of complexity because there you may not know all of the species that are present. And so there, you may be combining your proteomics data with, uh, with IT, like sequencing data as well to know which FASTA files to put in. The more and more FASTA files that you get or the more proteomes that you're putting in, it's what uh, Dr. Cromier talked about yesterday, increases your search space, but also your potential false positives. And so there are specific software that is used for microbiome research so that you're kind of combining everything into a single file or removing those redundancy uh, considerations. And so that goes a bit beyond the multi-species I'll talk to you about today, but it gives you an idea. And so some of the examples and the ways that we have done this is looking at uh, macrophage upon infection with a fungus and also with a bacteria. And the reason that we selected these two is they have similar modes of action for infection. It's both through the lungs. They also have similar profiles. They have similar virulence factors that they produce. And so, but the host will respond very differently if it is a fungal pathogen that is stimulating the response or a bacterial pathogen. And so we wanted to study what is that difference. And so we, here is the setup of the experiment. And so initially, and, and this can be tailored to whatever it is that you're looking at. So in this sense, we have macrophage and we have uninfected. We always have our control of uninfected cells. We also do a control of the bacteria or the fungi before they face the host so that we can see what they're like at more of a resting state. And then in this particular experiment, we have the macrophage, we put in the fungus first, and we take samples there so that we can see uh, what is that initial response to infection. We let it go. And within this disease, there can be an acute or a chronic infection. And so we, we mimic that in a sense in the lab where we have, we take samples early on, and then we let them kind of equilibrate over a couple of days and we take samples later on. And so this is all within uh, macrophage cells and the fungus. We then introduce a bacterial pathogen to this. And the biological context is that if a patient with a fungal infection was in the hospital, uh, this particular bacteria is a hospital acquired infection. And so it's possible they may face this co-infection status. And we profile that whether it be acute or after a prolonged amount of time. And so, it's neat because we can gain like just basic biological information about the system, but at the same time, we can also extrapolate that and see what more is there. So here's one of those uh, fancy egg diagrams that show that the host and then the different pathogens and how many uh, proteins we get. Uh, we, we always, at some point or another, we complement our proteomics data with, with true biological experiments or pieces or findings, I would say, because I'm, proteomics researcher. I love proteomics. I would only do that if I could, but reviewers want, they like to have some dynamic story going on. And so we will have uh, biological components as well that help to illustrate our, our purpose. So in this particular one, we can see that over time, the fungal cells here drop off 
over time. As you have the host responding and you introduce the bacteria, whereas the bacteria is increasing over time. And so this is a biological condition that is happening within our samples that we're seeing in a very like unbiased manner. And then PCA plots that you've seen uh, throughout the workshop and how they distinguish between infection, uninfection, different clusters, acute and chronic. And we see some information in our data set from that as well. Then what uh, the dual perspective allows us to do is to really hone in on a particular area or field that we're interested in, but look at it from the two perspectives. And so in the top plot here, this is reactive oxygen species, and it is a cluster of the proteins. We've taken the protein intensities of all reactive oxygen species associated proteins that were produced by the host. And we take their uh, average LFQ intensity, and we've plotted that across the infection. And we see that uh, when we get to the chronic infection state of both of them, that this drops off. Some of that is tied to the host cell death, and some of it is tied to the response, the immune response at that time. On the flip side, we look at, from the pathogen perspective, what are some uh, pathogen proteins that respond to reactive oxygen species? And so melanin is one of those particular proteins. And we look to, at uh, proteins that are involved in the pathway to produce melanin, and we see a similar trend. So then in the lab, what we've done is we've complemented that concept as to if the host is decreasing its reactive oxygen species, what is the pathogen doing? And so we can kind of map both sides uh, from a proteomics perspective and then also biologically in the lab. And, and it's a nice way to validate our data and show that we saw this in the proteomics and now we've seen it in the lab as well, but they're two very separate experiments. And one of the neat things that I, we put together here and I think one of the really, uh, is one of the exciting parts of what proteomics can do is that from a biological context in this uh, field, we always knew that the fungi can infect the host and the host will respond, but then there's a, a chronic or a latent infection where they adapt. And you can see that in the context of clinical infection as well as within the lab, but we didn't have the molecular pieces that were doing that. And so through, through our proteomics profiling, we see that we have this exact profile where there's a, a really rapid response to the host early on, but then during chronic infection, our um, volcano plots no longer have many significantly different proteins. And so you're going from a lot of change to very little change. But when we introduce other pathogens or another disruption to the system, you have more of this change again. And so we're complementing um, really a well-reported biological observation now at the protein level. And so that was one of the exciting pieces that we had doing this dual perspective profiling. I've also mentioned about more of the technology piece. And so when you're doing multi-species proteome profiling, it can be from different perspectives. Maybe you're gaining biological insight, or perhaps you're trying to get those low abundant proteins or peptides uh, from a certain system. So this is the DDA and DIA approach that we used with the TIMS TOF. And so from, D, from day one of the workshop or from the very first lecture, now you have more context as to what TIMS TOF is or what the time of flight instrument is, how it works. And now you've used software to, to perform your own DDA and DIA experiments and generate your own figures and plots. And so here we can see that uh, this is at the protein level. It can also be done at the peptide level because many of you have asked about it, you know, do you do protein experiments? Do you do peptide experiments? Which data do you look at? And both are very important, just depending on your question and what you want to show. And so here at the protein level, we have DIA and our overall identifications were quite a bit higher with DIA versus DDA using these this setup. Here we show with the DDA, the number of IDs across the different samples, as well as uh, with against DIA. We noticed that we had a very good increase in our pathogens. That's what we were excited to see. So for the bacterial pathogen, although we only identify 70 proteins out of, uh, typically we would see maybe 2000 on the mass spec when it was just the bacteria itself, it's still just a tiny snapshot of what the bacteria is doing but we've increased it 50%. So this technology, this uh, different way of doing it gives us more depth of coverage. And these are then uh, plots looking at the total protein counts. And we have similar plots that are all peptide level as well. 
So then we want to, uh, and you've seen these ones with the Venn diagrams and the plotting of the abundances and how that corresponds. And so here we've combined a biological uh, experiment with our proteomics experiment to kind of validate each other. And so in the top graph, we have our increase in fungal burden over time. We've done colony forming unit counts and you can see that over time it increases and it significantly increases. When we use our DDA approach, we do not have the same sensitivity. So we're not seeing that same pattern, but when we use DIA, we have that same ladder step up and it's significantly different. And so it's a really nice way to complement our proteomics observations with what is occurring in the lab and what we see in the lab with our proteomics data. And so they, they validate each other within the single experiment. And then we can also show that these biological findings really do connect to our protein abundance. So the more pathogen we have, the more proteins we're detecting. It's a pretty, I would say like straightforward concept in the way because the higher the burden, the more proteins, but technology really drives what we see. And so it's important to, to be testing and adapting. We can do similar where we have our uh, bacterial proteome as well. So this is again, the pathogen. We have more coverage of the pathogen using DIA and really it's those trends. So if you look at the DDA here, we do not see that laddering effect that we do from our CFUs, but in our DI data, you have that the ladder does change a little bit, but the overall significance, the pattern is identical, whether it is uh, the CFU or we have our protein abundance as well. And so when we when we submit this to the journal, um, we had one reviewer that commented on how nice the biology fit with the protein data. And this is a very like unbiased approach. We do not go into it trying to match them up. That That is what we found. And so, uh, and then for this particular one, we're also considering the host. So we have two pathogens that we look at. We also look at the host proteome. So we have three complete data sets that in reality, we could take any one of these data sets and it could be a complete story on its own. But if you put them all together, it gives you more power to understand infection. Um, you also wanna keep in mind, what is your take home message? So with this particular publication, we really wanted to focus in on the fungal pathogen. And so that's how we led the story and that's where we, where we took it. Uh, but you could also look at the bacteria, you could look at the host, you kind of have to justify why you're looking at one and not the other two. Uh, but it, it's all about kind of the question and what we are interested in. And so for this particular one, then we identified uh, a fungal protein of interest. And we have from a different experiment, we have some biological data that we can use to validate it and show that a target we identified from the proteome profiling, if we disrupt it, it also disrupts the phenotype. And so this kind of constant back and forth of consideration of what are the protein responses, what is our biological response, how do they fit together? And it doesn't, it doesn't always work out uh, that they come together at once, but it's nice when it does. Um, another example, this is uh, more in an infection setting. So this is a mouse that has been infected with a fungal pathogen with cryptococcus. And over time, then we are looking at uh, the different proteomes and how they change and the signatures of disease. And so here you can recognize, uh, you be familiar with the pipeline, with the sample preparation pipeline, also with tandem mass tags. So that's something that we've covered as well in the workshop. And we use them for labeling of our samples so that we can multiplex. I, ben had about 760 samples. And so this is one where multiplexing really gave us a lot of power to analyze all of those. And then we have our, um, the number of proteins we identify, uh, the PCA plot of the host, and you can see that time is a factor as well as infected or uninfected, but it depends on the state of the host. And so we get information of what the host is doing. We can then also, again, complement this to validate our proteomics results by seeing, looking at some immune associated proteins. So I know during uh, the uh, lab this morning, some of you were doing the trend plots and using that feature in Perseus. So this is a similar concept. We know that we have that we're inducing an infectious state, and so how is the host responding? We should see uh, the complement system, the innate immune system. We should see features of those uh, systems being activated, 
And so here we take all of the innate associated proteins within our host proteome, all of the adaptive associated proteins, and we've plotted their abundance. You could definitely do that more targeted and say, look at one individual uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine or something like that, but we want to do it on a global scale. And then uh, Ben has complemented that by taking individual ones and looking at their patterns. So from that data, and this is where the trend plots come in, and the concept of using these as biomarker signatures is that we have host proteins that we know they're involved in infection. We detect their abundance changes within the uh, proteome, and one of them goes down, one of them goes up. And then using Pearson correlation to the slope of that line, we then identify other proteins that have that same signature. And our thought is that if you have, a, like in the clinic, if you have an opportunity to measure biomarkers using mass spec, now we have a, a more detailed signature to do so. Or if you have an ELISA test, perhaps there's multiple um, antibodies that you're looking for or detecting instead of just one. And for fungal disease in particular, that's important because we can have um, uh, differences in baseline of our response. So if we, if we can kind of attack this from different ways, it gives us more power for um, diagnostics and monitoring disease. The other way to look at this data is not just a yes or no in infection, but also what changes over time. So that's what the plots are here, where we have some uh, proteins that are elevated and then decrease versus are lower and then higher over time. So it gives us power too, to kind of know what is the state of infection, not just whether it's occurring. And so you can gain quite a bit of information and that's from the host side, but we can do the exact same thing from the pathogen side as well. And so here, this is these are from the pathogen perspective. We have our colony forming unit counts here where we see the number, the burden of the pathogen within this particular organ. Uh, interestingly, our proteomics data was much more sensitive than the CFU counts. So we can actually detect, even though we cannot um, I, like detect the fungal cells at this three day mark, our proteome responds very quickly. So it, it, it gives us more detail early on. And then we can look from the pathogen perspective and we can do those trend lines and see, now we know what the host is doing, which proteins of the pathogen are changing and what is their profile. So whether in this case, it's over time. And the thought is, if you're looking for more of a diagnostic purpose and if treatment, uh, we know within fungal pathogens, treatment depends a lot. There's very distinct time courses of treatment. And so the state that a patient is in also drives which treatment is the best for them. And so this is information that you can gain from looking at these protein profiles. And so that's that's where we've taken the multi-species uh, profiling. As I mentioned, we've also done it in plants. We look at uh, wheat and how it responds to fungal disease. Uh, so you can really be quite creative in how you wanna look at it, but the pipelines are very similar. The bioinformatics is very similar. And uh, so it can be very useful. Protein-protein interaction profiling, that's another concept we talked about early on in the, in the first module. And so here again, enrichment is one of the considerations. So you can do this with uh, a bait that is, that is um, tagged to a resin where one protein is tagged and then you wash other proteins over it or incubate it with other proteins so that you can identify complexes or interacting partners. Or you may wanna do it more with the bio ID approach. And that might be more of a within the cell looking at interactions. There can be technical limitations, such as if you're going to use the bait and prey approach, you'll have to have a tag on one of your proteins or with bio ID, if you're doing that, again, you have to have a tag on, the, on, or on your protein so that it interacts with other, you can detect the other interactions. So that's a very um, low throughput approach to it. And then there's other methods for more higher throughput interaction um, as well. One of the biggest pieces for protein-protein interaction profiling is the controls. So I mentioned that as well in module one. So if you're doing pull downs or you're looking at those affinity purifications, you really need to make sure that your controls are in place so that you can tell what is background versus what is a, a, a true interacting partner. And one of the really nice things about where proteomics has come and bioinformatics and the technology and the instrumentation is that it's not just a yes or no answer 
but it's also a statistically driven answer. So abundance can also give you a lot of information as to what is background versus what is a real interactor. And then also uh, how, how uh, much characterization is there? So when you're doing interaction mapping, is it something that's completely uncharacterized? Do you have some idea of what should be binding? Do you have some positive controls you can consider? Those sorts of thoughts. Some of the applications are within protein complexes, uh, host pathogen interactions, antibody binding, uh, target identification, different uh, experiments like that. And so string is one of the uh, probably very common databases used for protein-protein interactions. I, have you used string? Are people familiar with this a bit? No, some, okay. All right, so kind of a mix. I, it, it is constantly being updated and new features are being added, which I think is very cool. It's always nice when there's a, a tool that is free and available to use, and then it's constantly being improved. And so the string database uh, can give you an idea of interactions on, on all different uh, parameters and um, evidence. So this is the, the landing page where you go. It allows you to search the protein by name. If you know it, you can search by multiple proteins and it gives you an example of how to search. You can see over here, there are examples. So if you're not sure of the formatting it provides, you can look at protein sequences. So you can put in the sequence if you want the sequence information. Uh, you can now indicate different values and ranks to give a bit more of a, a semi-quantitative analysis of those interactions. You can look at protein families, pathway process disease. You can add different organisms depending on what you're working with. It does have a very substantial drop down list here of pathogens or not pathogens of organisms. Uh, but you may be working with a with a identifier, a species or a strain that doesn't that string cannot read the identifier. So it gives you options for adding in. And then it provides examples as well. And the nice thing here is that you could take, uh, so we, we do this in two different ways. You could take a single protein, uh, whether it's from your data set or if you just want to investigate that protein and you can put it in and see what it interacts with, or you can give it a whole list of proteins. So say you've done your pull down and you have all these candidates that come out, you can feed all of those in here and it'll show you how they interact together based on either experimental evidence or literature. Uh, and you can uh, update that or kind of customize it too. So I have an example here where I've put in different gene names uh, and gene IDs for our fungal, one of our fungal pathogens. And you'll see in the drop-down list, it, it has a whole bunch. Anything that has this much cryptococcus in it is, is quite well done. That means it's gonna have everything else because no one ever puts fungi into things. So I'm not bitter about it, I'm just saying. <laughs> so if you're working on any other system, you should be fine. Uh, but it does have quite a bit of uh, cryptococcal species. And so we, we can select the species. You can also leave it as default. Uh, but if you're working with a gene name that may be found in my, mouse or human or yeast, then that could be a challenge when you're looking for what is a real interactor. And so this one has uh, the different list of names that we put in. It will then show up typically, not always, but it will bring you to a table that um, gives you a little bit of information, but may, al may also ask you to verify things. So if you put in a gene name that is common to different species, it may ask, you know, are you, are you sure? All right, so uh, then you can click continue and it will it will default and generate a, an interaction map. And so if you've put in one single uh, protein, then you're in, depending on how well it's characterized, you will get different interaction maps formed. If you put in a whole bunch of them, it will show you, it'll, it's, this is showing you the relationship amongst the proteins that you entered into the system. So it allows you to find new things, but then also look at your current uh, data set and how it's interacting. And you'll see there are several that do not have any interaction partners. It doesn't mean that they don't have any anywhere, it's that they're not in the database or they're not characterized. Uh, and then there's others that have quite a few interaction partners. And you can gain more information perhaps about what they're doing. And so in this particular example, we have, uh, this is significantly different proteins from volcano plots. And we took all the ones that showed an increase in abundance and put those into string to look at what is the relationship amongst the proteins that are changing within this particular experiment. I, another way that we've done this is taking one uh, 
putative antifungal targets. So it was one like fungal protein, but we know nothing about it. It's uncharacterized and we put it into string and then it shows us other proteins it interacts with. So it helps us get a little bit more information about this uncharacterized protein that we can't find anything about. So it can be quite useful uh, for different purposes. So once we have, once the default is here, there are many ways to kind of optimize it, customize it. Uh, there's also great, like there's R packages that you can use string networks. Uh, GG Profile, I believe, does does it do any interaction networks? Do you know? No? Yeah. Pardon? Yeah. It does. Okay. All right. So, so there's a lot of ways. This is one um, uh, way to do it, but there are other tools as well. But you can see here, there's a, at the bottom, there'll be a uh, icon bar and your legend will tell you what everything means. Sometimes in manuscripts, reviewers want this legend within the figure legend or within the materials and methods so that the colors between the, the nodes, the edges, they know where the information is coming from. And so what you can see is some of these colors represent whether they're experimentally determined, uh, whether it's curated, whether they're neighborhood joining or um, how well they're they're known, or it can even be text mining. And so you also need to be a little bit leery that just because the two things are mentioned together in text mining doesn't mean they're actually interacting. So it's important too for you to, to be aware of. And then it tells you what the nodes mean, for whether it's empty or has a color to it, as well as if there's a protein structure in there, if the protein structure is known. So from the legend itself, you can gain some information. You also have flexibility to optimize it and, and set it up a little bit differently how you like. So in settings, you can change what sort of network you wanna see. Um, this uh, interaction score can be quite uh, valuable. So right now it's at a medium confidence, which is the default. And that's typically where we look at things. But if you wanted to be a bit more stringent, of course, you could take that up to the higher level confidence, which I think is at uh, 0.7. Or if you want to look at a broader way, you could drop that down. But it gives you a little bit of opportunity to, um, to see other features. Within the analysis tab, this is all based on the network that is displayed above. On the, so the original one that I, that I showed. And it can bring in also some gene ontology information. And so if, if these are annotated, if your genes do have some annotation, it can give you information on where they're located or where they're predicted to be located, uh, different CAG pathways. I know people have asked about protein and metabolites and pathways. It can give you insight into that. Uh, some of these, depending on how well characterized they are, you will have more lists here and you can click on them and color them different dot, different colors. I, you can look at the um, the confidence as well, the strength of how, how they're being identified or classified. You can then export all of this. And so once you have a, a figure that you like, you can export uh, the high resolution bitmap if you want to use it in a publication or uh, if you're using you know somewhere else, you can do a lower resolution one. You can also export the different tables, the protein sequences, all that kind of stuff. And so it's um, it can be useful for even going through and, and looking at the proteins later on. You'll see here in the bottom, there's a tabular form of the proteins that are identified, and then they map back to the number that's in the, the figure itself. There's under clusters. We will do this sometimes where you can define how many clusters you wanna see. So I'll, I'll show in just a minute, but uh, string will default the colors just, um, it'll put up the different colors, but there, and you can physically see that maybe there's some that are clustering, but it's not based on anything. And so you can look, or it's, it's based on their interactions. It's not something you're telling the software. You can use different um, strategies then to define numbers of clusters. But if you say define three clusters, it's going to give you three clusters. So if you say five, it'll give you five. So it's just, it's a bias that you're introducing into your network. Uh, which is perfectly fine, but you have to report that in your methods. And so here is the original one without clustering where the colors are defined by the software. If we tell it to give us three clusters based on distance and interactions, these are the three ones that it's identified. And then you have your uncharacterized here. And those will change if you say five, 
I would suspect this one may come out as something different. I and and you'll get more information too in that sense. And this is a feature with the um, the gene ontology terms, as I mentioned, if you click on them and you want to color the ones that fall under that gene ontology, if you want to see a cluster of particular proteins, then you can do that and it will color those ones. You can have multiple ones colored. They can fall under different categories and you can tailor it in that way as well. And if you zoom in on specific areas or clusters, you'll see that they each have their protein IDs. And so you can map those back to what you originally looked at or what you want to find. You can identify which other ones are there. And if you hover over any of them, it'll also show you the names of the, of the protein, uh, perhaps some gene ontology information if it's available, other known interactors, that sort of piece. And so it can give you ideas of, of what that sort of cluster, what that function is. And for some of them that have a protein structure known, they'll have the protein structure symbol within the circle. And then you can see as you hover over it, it will also give you more of that information. And so if you were particularly, if you were interested in, in mining like the protein data bank, or you want to use AlphaFold, you could go here and see this one has a, has a structure known of it. So maybe I can use that to map others or predict other ones as well. Some of the new features uh, that I wanted to highlight were these pathway and processes. And so here you can actually just enter in a term of interest. And so I've selected proteasome. It has uh, the different uh, biological species that are here, or organisms that are possible. And so I've just, I've selected Saccharomyces. It will give you the term. And if you click on this, uh, it's a paper specifically on the proteasome within Saccharomyces, and it'll link to the publication. And then here's an example where we're looking at a very defined uh, cluster, not necessarily everything, but this is within the proteasome of yeast. These are the proteins that come up as being reported. And we have, you can see there's all kinds of different edges. So different evidence uh, is, is um, bringing, being brought into this uh, diagram as well. And so that was, a, that was a new feature. That's kind of something if you want to look more general and you didn't have say a list of proteins, but you, you, know, you knew it interacted or you knew it was involved in a function, then you can put that in there as well. And so these are some different uh, examples of diagrams. So this is uh, an earlier one that we did and I, I feel so naive now because I didn't know you could change the colors in the string. <laughs> so you can, which is really cool. And, uh, and also the clustering feature was not something that I was aware of. And so here you can see we have clear clusters. We've added in a general term for the clusters based on proteins that are within it so that um, you can kind of functionalize and see the trend of what is happening there. But in these particular ones, we had ribosomal processing and DNA synthesis and replication. Uh, immune signaling was one of the, these clusters here were related to immune signaling. And so we pulled, highlighted that. Immune response within this main cluster was a lot of the affiliated proteins. And then this one's like a hairball. This one's useless, but it looks neat. So, but it, it shows you. So these, these ones here are based on uh, volcano plots and the significantly different proteins. And so not only does it tell you about the interactions and the clusters and the emphasis of the proteins, it also tells you how many are changing which is also neat. So it's another way to visualize volcano plots in the sense that these ones were all significantly increased during infection. These ones were all significantly decreased during infection or whether you have a single pathogen or dual two pathogens and how the host responds. Uh, you can think you get all that information actually from here. So we see extreme remodeling and disruption of the host uh, at the, like across the proteins within this string network. So I, I always think it's really cool when you can like have a plot in a different way and you can convey your story in one way and then show it and highlight it in a different way and the evidence matches up. It's really powerful when you're putting together a paper or a, um, a thesis, a grant, things like that. In this one here, you can see that, that I've matured a little bit. I learned, well, I think Brie did this one. So <laughs> maybe she's more mature in the beginning from the very start, but we learned that you can do the clustering. And in this particular one, I think we had three clusters to start or maybe five clusters. And one of the reviewers said, yes, if you put in five, you'll get out five. We were like, 
Yeah, that's a good point. So we had to make sure that we reported that, that our k-means clustering was set at five, and that's when we get our five clusters. And so we then went through and we looked at the proteins that were involved and we gave them a higher order classification. And in this, in this one, we were interested in this proteasome function. So in the next level of the story, we zoomed in on that and we talked about those interacting proteins there as well. And then this one here is a more recent one. And this is to highlight those, uh, the terms. So if you want to look at specific gene ontology terms, we, um, we have a immune system associated, that was the focus. And so then by clicking on it, you can see how many of them have a single function, like this uh, immune system, whether it's caspase associated, or some of them have multiple functions with the different colors that are all fall in there. So it classifies them differently, but it also shows which ones are better characterized than others as well. So you can, it's, it's a rather, um, I would say it's a rather dynamic way to look at your data and can fluctuate from time to time, depending on which proteins you're looking at, what sort of thing you want to emphasize, what do you want to gain from that, um, those plots as well. Yeah. I So I, I test out different ones. So uh, I think three is um, k-means. I think the default, it says it at three. It won't show you that. You still have to select it on. But if it was a data set, like this one here, even without the colors, I can see which, like roughly how many clusters there's probably going to be. I don't know the relationship between this and this, but I do know that I can not I can see that this is a group here that is clearly separate from this group here. I don't know what's going to happen with these ones. Uh, and so it is similar with um, your intensity plots, your LFQ intensity plots. If you're looking at those, you don't know where the clustering is, but you can try it and see what it shows you. It depends how specific you want to get as well. So the more clusters, the smaller they're going to be, perhaps the closer to a, a particular story that it leads you. So you can you could definitely test it out and, and have a look. Yeah. Last question, because there is another option. Can you mm -hmm. NCL to perform the clustering? Yes, it's yes. So That's right. Two options, so you can decide how many groups you want, or you can decide just, I don't know how many, I'm going to use on the granularity uh, parameter, mm -hmm. and then you will have the same type of record. Excellent, yes, yes. Then I, I think it's an option within string yes. as well. Yes, yeah, that you could do that, yeah, yeah. So right. Yeah, yeah, so so lots of times, thank you. So lots of times it is valuable to to, see what your data, what it looks like and, and what you can get from there. So then that's, that's like walking through string a little bit. Uh, string also then uh, connects to Cytoscape. And so there is a, a button here within the exports where you can take this information and you can put it into Cytoscape, which is another uh, interaction mapping tool. And it's free to download. Uh, and so you can use that. And then this is an image of the uh, of the tool itself. So I found this to be much more customizable and a bit more fun to work with. String is you can customize it to some extent, but that's about it. There, you know, you don't have as much control over which color goes where all the time. I uh, whereas this one, you can change the shape, the size, the look, the color, everything. So it's a nice um, a nice tool to use. It also will have slightly different different information, perhaps. Then string, sometimes the different tools have, um, they it may have more yeast proteins, for example, or it might be better adapted to human proteins. So you can test out uh, what works best within your data set. It will also show you like different sizes too for more uh, characterized uh, proteins. And so Cytoscape was another, another one used. And uh, Reactome is one that I want to highlight too. They they have similar functions, uh, but depending on which biological system you're working with, you may prefer one over the other. Uh, this one here was quite neat because this is in humans and it's the, the baseline, the default, but you can see on the side here, it has all these different terms that you can look into. And so I worked within the immune system one here and there's constant drop down menus that allow you then to look at the connections between the proteins, uh, where they fit within the bigger picture. You can be very granular as to looking at which ones are together. 
So these all these are more the um, the interaction map is provided, and then you can see where do yours fit on there. Uh, Keg mapping is a similar concept. Your map is provided, and then where do you fit in that map? Yeah. Um, it's been a while I've worked with React tool. So do you know if uh, they now integrate plant genomes? Ah, uh, you. I do not know. No, I don't know. I find not many do. <laughs> so plants like fungi. Um, no, I, I find string to be the least biased, I would say, in that sense. I both... Uh, Cytoscape had a good number of species. Reactome, I've done it once with fungi, and I uh, and I th I think it was a uh, actually I think it was mouse. It was a fungal infection, but we we couldn't find the fungi in there, so we had mouse. We used it for the mouse, the host side. I um, but I find it much more biased towards that more mammalian systems. But it may have changed. The yeah yeah. Uh, there's also David is another one as well as another one of these uh, interaction tools. That one is very human centric. Uh, and so you kind of want to see, depending on what system that you're working in, uh, what works best. But they're all kind of fun to play around with. I have to say they are. And, and it's just a sample set of ones that you can use. So then going from uh, the multi-species analysis into protein interaction mapping, into more of the multi-omics data integration and those considerations here uh, for multi-omics, uh, experimental design is a really big one. So are you doing um, RNA-seq with proteomics? Are you doing proteomics with metabolomics? What sort of uh, molecular levels are you working with? And what do you wanna get out of your data set? What is the purpose? Of what you're doing. So I, I will have people that come to me and say, well, we did RNA-seq on the data, so we're going to do proteomics. I'm like, why would you, why? Like, you know, what do you want to get out of it? And they want to validate the RNA-seq with the proteins. In theory, that's a nice idea, but there's really big challenges. And I think from uh, our nose group, there will be a, the Marie Pierre will talk about some of those challenges uh, when you're looking at transcript expression levels versus protein abundance. Uh, the data sets, that you're working with, you want to consider how complete they are, how many reads for transcriptomics, and then your proteomics. How are you going to be able to put them together? So that comes into the analysis and tools. Uh, one of the nice features about Perseus is that if your data set is in that format, so you have a an identifier, you have uh, it's in a column, you can bring anything into Perseus, and you can work within the space. So. Um, we will do uh, proteomics and metabolomics, and we'll bring both of them into Perseus. It doesn't really matter which data set it is. So you have a lot of flexibility in that sense to, once you know how to use the uh, the tool, you can apply it to many different things. And so uh, that's that's quite useful too. Some of the applications uh, is that kind of that concept of comprehensive mapping. So you want to see we have evidence that a protein is produced, but we want to know, is the end product a metabolite produced? So can we follow that pathway along? Uh, you may want to look at gene expression and then protein production, and it gives you that more complete picture sometimes to validate. So we've done experiments where we have a protein that is involved in regulation, like uh, gene regulation. So then it would make sense for us to do maybe a, a real-time PCR on some of those end products. I personally avoid transcriptomics at all costs. I do not like it, but that's just my complete bias. And now we do metabolomics. I also do not like it. So I'm a proteomics person, <laughs> but people do like to bring them together. So that's fine. Uh, there's down and upstream perspectives too. So you can, you know, say you're looking for one particular protein and you don't find it, but you find ones that are upstream. That's also really powerful. So you can, you can do a lot. Uh, one of the uh, experiments that we that we uh, set up to do proteomics and metabolomics profiling, uh, this was driven entirely by the funding agency. They wanted to see met the metabolomics is like all the rage right now. So they wanted to see the metabolites that are produced by the plant. So I very naively said, yes, of course we can do that. No problem. Um, it, it is a problem. It's hard. So we had uh, we have bacteria that's grown in different ways. This is the molecular farming workflow. We have uh, plants that are infiltrated with that bacteria. From the plant leaves, we take half the sample for proteomics, half the sample for metabolomics. That part's all good. Then we do our proteomics pipeline. 
the typical one, we extract from the plants, uh, the proteins, we digest them, we use TMT labeling, and then we uh, measure them on the mass spec. And we do this, this is over a time course. So we have between zero and seven days. And we're actually looking for the production of one protein, uh, which is a terrible way to do proteomics on plants because you only get like a snapshot of the proteome, but it gives you lots of other information too. So even if you don't find that one protein, you get a lot of other information. And then here for the metabolites, the extraction was pretty straightforward. We ran it on the mass spec. Anyone that's done metabolomics, if you do LCMS once, then your, uh, your mapping, your features, you could have three compounds or 3000 compounds and you don't know which is which. So then we do a second round of mass spec on some of those features to have a bit more confidence in what we're looking at. Uh, for this particular project, uh, Nick, the PhD student working on it, he had like, I don't even know, uh, 17,000 features from the metabolomics and he was like super excited. In the end, he had 14 metabolites that he worked on. So it was, it was a little deflating for him. But uh, this is the idea of the integration. And so he, these are the metabolites that he ended up confidently identifying. He has combined... Uh, the proteomics data, those that have the asterisks were found to be significantly different within the proteomics data. And if they're red, uh, then it shows an alignment between protein and metabolite. So that was how he was going, how he was framing the story. If it is in blue, then it shows a discourse. So the protein was lower and the metabolite was higher. And so he had one that showed that pattern. But uh, this is a nice sort of, it tells you the abundance of the metabolites, the production of the metabolites, but then we also can see the overlap with the proteomes or where they're different. And we can see that time is a big factor, a big driver. These are all the time points compared, but the, um, the method of preparing the bacteria did not have any effect on the metabolome. And that's uh, this part here. And so what he did then with these uh, metabolites, took them into CAG. And so I know there's been a couple of questions about CAG and mapping. And CAG is a really nice database for looking at proteins and metabolites. And you can, you can, you can put them together. And it gives you flexibility as to which pathways you look at. Um, you could do it in a very unbiased manner. You can give it a list of proteins and it will give you the entire map of the metabolome or all the pathways and it'll show you where your proteins are, or you can look at one specific pathway. And so that's uh, how we've used CAG a bit. So this is an example of uh, looking at, this is in wheat, for example, and looking at plant pathogen interaction. So that we have not entered in any of our data. This is the default from CAG and it'll give you a legend as to what things mean but it shows you a specific pathway. So if you knew that you were looking at jasmonic acid pathway, for example, you could then look at the proteins that are present and that's where you can look at your proteomics data set and kind of map them there. You can also do it where you have, so this is the example that Nick used. He had uh, at the end, he had this methyl jasminate uh, metabolite that had been produced. And so he mapped back all the proteins in green our proteins that we identified in this pathway and all proteins that were higher abundant and then our metabolite was also produced. And so it was a nice kind of um, validation of the data set from both sides because we have that higher protein production and the metabolite being produced. And we can see that throughout the pathway, we've identified quite a few of the precursors to get to that metabolite. And so um, this, yeah, so this is the way that we've used for cake mapping. Uh, but as I mentioned, there's a lot more, we were looking at a very targeted uh, approach, but you can also do it in a very untargeted way where you can look at general changes that are happening. Uh, and then I like to give an example of a, a experimental fail, honestly, from our, from our group. And this is, this is on me. So because, um, because clearly we can do proteomics and metabolomics now, then uh, another funder said, we want to look at the metabolites of plants. And I was like, yes, we can definitely do that. So here we have a uh, mycotoxin, the oxynivalenol, and we inoculate it into wheat. We then do our proteomic profiling to see how the wheat responds to this mycotoxin. And we have beautiful proteomics data. That heat map or the PCA plot I showed you, I think on day one or yesterday um, with the plant proteins, it is beautiful data. 
For the metabolomics, which we took the same samples, this is similar to what Dr. Cormier show, showed with the honeybees in a fact that these are our metabolite profiles that came out. And we have this feature here in our um, uninfected. And we have the same exact same feature in our infected, which is, um, is it tween, tween, that we add to solubilize the, or not solubilize, to um, inject the mycotoxin into the plant. We add tween so that it stays soluble and it sticks to the plant. That's part of the, um, the, the biological way to do this so that it doesn't get washed away when you water the plants. Tween on a metabolomics experiment is a disaster because it contaminates everything. And so now your background, it's like having SDS in a proteomics, which you all now would go, <gasps> not SDS, right? Like you wouldn't, you don't want to do this. So we, um, it, it raised our background so high that we cannot detect our metabolite features anymore. So that was quite disappointing for us because I was all excited to have metabolomics data. So that shows you where like the, the thought of it, and, and we're working with a collaborator on this. And, and I was like, I really need that metabolomics data. We have to look at it and everything. And he's like, yeah, it just looks odd. You, you didn't add something to it like tween or anything like that. It's like, yeah, we definitely did. Yeah. Yeah. So experimental design, really critical. That's a take home message. All right. And then the last point that I want to talk about is the, are the validation experiments. So how can I get around doing a Western blot is really how I should title this. But uh, you have to think about what are the appropriate methods for uh, validating your experiments. Almost always reviewers will ask for Western blots. It, it doesn't always make sense. I, what is the question that they want? So sometimes, you know, your PI may say, oh, just go do a Western blot on it. Yeah, but why? Like, what is the purpose behind it? You can push back a little. That's all right. Uh, is it achievable? So we have a project right now where we're trying to validate a plant protein. It will cost us $4,000 for one antibody that is not even specific to the plant. That doesn't make any sense. So no, we're not going to do that approach. And then uh, whether you look at validation literature or experimental, I like to combine the two of them. So I always like to have some sort of literature validation, whether the protein has been observed in a different system or the observate the trend has been reported elsewhere, even if it's in a different species, but just the, like some sort of overlap, if it's transcriptomics and proteomics, it's nice to be able to show some sort of positive control. And then your discovery has a bit more weight to it because then you don't have to validate every single one of your discovery pieces because you can also pull from the literature. Uh, because when you're doing with your proteomics data, if you have a volcano plot that has 25 proteins, how do you decide what to validate, right? It's nice to pick something that is well characterized as your baseline and show, look, proof of principle, this protein is higher uh, in our proteomics. We did an ELISA, it's also higher. Great. Then everything else, you can be a bit more um, aggressive or a little bit more assertive on your claims because you've shown the proof of principle in your uh, in your overall approach. So we use this then to confirm results, um, satisfy reviewer comments, which I put up there, and it's true. That is often what we do. And you will see in papers, there'll be a line and you can read it and you know that it's just in response to a comment. Uh, and also to provide new biological insight. Sometimes we get uh, new avenues to explore based on what's been done. So this is a very, uh, very simple um, way to do a literature comparison. Uh, here we're, we took, uh, this is from a, an undergrad student in my lab, actually, when I first started. And he was looking at the um, proteome of tears during uh, when there's bacteria. Uh, like a bacterial infection of the eye versus not. And so he, there was previous work that had shown in the tear proteome. So we showed overlap with our approach and the other approach. And so that's like a technical variation where we can show we identified these 233 that the previous study showed. And then we also had 72 additional proteins. And so then someone is less apt to say, yeah, but those 72 are contamination or they're not real because we're capturing that other full proteome. We're also adding new information to the field. Uh, the next one there is looking at the cellular proteome and the secretome, I believe, of the bacteria growing under different conditions. And we show that we have nice overlap between our cellular proteome and our secretome because the proteins would be produced in the cell before they're released. 
And so that can be a really nice way to say these proteins are likely secreted in a higher abundance than they were present within the cell because we're only detecting them in the supernatant or they're being actively secreted into the environment because they're not present in both. So it's, it's those kind of concepts that you can use. And then here we show um, the overlap across our proteome and uh, transcriptome for specific uh, targets. And ones that we identified that were only previously reported at the transcript level, and now we're reporting at the protein level. So they're very, very simple. They're circles. It's not, this one was not fancy at all. And, uh, and it really is though, it's validating from the literature. This is our Western blot. Here we had to do one. I know it's, it's, it's hideous. <laughs> so um, these are one of our Western blots that we do. We're looking for immune associated proteins. So that we did IL-1 uh, beta and TNF alpha and, and then our loading control here as well. I, so these are our uh, protein intensities that we found. And we showed like a significant increase here. Here are protein intensities. And then I, we, we chose to do this Western blot because those antibodies are readily available. And we show the same trend, although uh, Western blots tend to be semi-quantitative. And so that's, that's why I don't like them. But if it shows the same trend, then that's, that's nice. Uh, and it gave us kind of that biological piece to complement our proteomics data. And uh, the, other, the other way to do it is new biological insight. So you have literature review to validate your results. You have a uh, Western blot, which is a very common one to validate your results. And here we have an experimental one as well. And so in this particular example, uh, we're looking at protein production profiles uh, for uh, enzymes and uh, from extracts. And we wanted to see which fraction had activity. So these are separated and we can measure where the proteins are then do profiling with the fractions and see which ones have activity. And those are the ones that are marked with the asterisks. If we do proteome profiling on those, we can see what are the proteins that are present, what's their distribution. And in this particular example, we are interested in inhibitors. We have classification here of inhibitors. And so then we went and did a enzymatic assay to show that if you inhibit the target, then you have a reduction in the phenotype that we were particularly interested in. And so this is a way that we're using a um, chemical compound to validate our results and validate our approach and our proteomics, showing that we identify inhibitor. If we use that inhibitor, it works in the lab, but we're also gaining new knowledge because we didn't know that inhibitor was in that fraction as well. So it gives you quite a bit of, um, it's neat to have the two sides. You can validate and gain new insight at the same time. Uh, this is another example in that same sense. And so uh, in this one here, we have um, LFQ intensities where we see a, a reduction in catalase production between a wild type and a mutant. And this is uh, from the proteomics results. And then we've done experimental plates to look at uh, zones of clearing, which correlate to that production of catalase in an indirect manner. So we're gaining information about what does this what does this particular gene do within the strain when we knock it out? What is the impact on the phenotype? But at the same time, we're also validating our proteomics results that the, re the reduction in catalase also reduces then susceptibility or um, ability to withstand uh, peroxide and uh, different reactive oxygen species. So you, so you can use it in different ways then to answer a question and get more information too.